Welcome to If Only You Knew, where each week we take a deep dive into the careers and experiences of people from different backgrounds, cultures, countries and ages to discuss pivotal moments in their lives and the lessons they have learnt along the way. If they told people the truth, they wouldn't last very long. Whether you're a school student, in an established career, mapping your academic pathway, searching for the perfect career, looking to change careers or just plain curious, then this podcast is for you. I'm your host, Christy McCormack, and I want to ask you, what would you do differently if only you knew? Okay, so with me, I've got Robert Ray. So thanks for joining me, Robert. So can you tell me what prison you're in? I am in uh, Colorado State Prison in Kenya City, Colorado. And why are you in prison? I am in prison for complicity and murder, which basically means I can be charged with um, a crime even if I wasn't. Or at the scene, or in the same city. So, were you guilty of what you were convicted of? Do you think? No, it's not that I think I'm, I'm not guilty of what I'm convicted of. And what sentence were you given? Say it again. What sentence were you given? I was sentenced to death and uh, to life sentence. Years, I don't even keep up with them because it don't really matter once you got those five letters and those four letters. So, what did you feel when they the jury came back and your sentence was death? What went through your mind? Um, it was relief. Relief. Um, yeah. When when I got my first sentence, um. Knowing that I was about to spend the rest of my life in prison, but then also seeing everybody you uh, you cared about and, and, and was always there for, now not there for you. Um, for instance, my uh, wife at the time, um, she quickly moved on within the first week of me being locked up. Um, and when you sitting back thinking about stuff like that, um, you found out how powerful the word expect is. Like, you would expect people to be there for you, um, to love you, and you wasn't getting that. So that, on top of me being in prison for stuff I didn't do, um, happened to go from a uh, uh, dependent um, to where I got to depend on people. Um, I just wanted to die, so I was happy to receive the death penalty because I viewed it as a uh, peace. So, do you do you feel that she was sort of justified in her in in what she did in walking away, or do you hold some sort of you know grudge or anger towards her for doing that? Absolutely not. She was not justified. Um, uh, what she did. Um, I've done so much for that woman um, in our family, and the way I was discarded and threw to the side, uh, it's it's just cold. Um, Yeah, there's many nights of of depression and stress where I can't eat, can't sleep, and Especially when you've done nothing to deserve what you're thrown at you, you know. So there's no justification in anything like that. So how did you sort of move on from that hurt that you felt by being abandoned, I suppose, by the people that loved you? How did you cope with that? Um, you go a lot of years. Wake up every 
day, you're pissed off at the world, you don't want to live, you, um, you hate people. Did you find that your behavior changed because you had that hatred? of everything that was happening to you? Did you find yourself you were a different person in prison? No. Um, I'm still me. You're still you? Uh, I'm not one that acts a certain way because I'm angry. You know, I just, uh, I just become extremely introverted. Um, you. Yeah. So, so did anyone in your family stick by you through the whole process? My mother and my sister, they, uh, they did that for me. Um, um, my brother, uh, I got a brother who, who um, I was always deaf for when he was incarcerated. Uh, I moved mountains for him. Uh, he didn't even need to ask for nothing. Um, but it's when I got locked up. I got a letter from him in 2015, first time. And, um, yeah, so a lot of people, uh, like I definitely now, I would have respect them to be. Um, at some point in my life, I decided to not wake up and carry around this 200 pounds of, uh, of anger and frustration. And I was able to just get over it. It's, it's not pertinent to it. So what do you think made you come to that realisation that you just had to accept it? Um, my, 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 energy, you know, my life, they got on with their life um, mm-hmm. without me. You know, their life was going on, so I had to um, create me a life and there's these walls on there, so I can now have something to focus on. Yeah. So I will get to sort of what you've done with your life since you've been in prison in a minute, but can you tell me about the court process that you went through and, and how it worked and, and what happened? Uh, the court process is long. It's frustrating because you've got to just sit there and listen to everything. Um, you've got a bunch of lawyers that your mouthpiece, and my first set of lawyers, um, In hindsight, you know, me coming in, I don't know nothing about legal stuff. Uh, these guys have been lawyers for 25 years, so I expect them to know um, what they're doing. But uh, it's long and it's frustrating. And you being judged by anything you do and don't do. If I'm sitting there you know, with just a plain face, they're writing about me in the paper saying I'm sitting there with no remorse, so I'm sitting there like I don't care. If I laughed about something, they saying I'm sitting there um, not caring and like it's a joke. You got to watch people come in and say stuff that's not true. You got to just sit there and take it. If you look at them mean and in the wrong way, which I never did, they will uh, judge you on that and say you intimidate the witness. It's just it's long, frustrating, and um, yeah. So how did you find the restraint? Because I imagine that it would be really, really difficult to sit in a courtroom and have people say things about you that aren't true. So how did you find yourself, how did, how did you, how were you able to control yourself to not just have an outburst and just scream and yell and tell them that they were wrong? I don't know. I've seen a lot of people who can't control it. Um, Lucky enough to where I was able to have some restraint. Um, I have restraint. I I have control of uh, my actions. I never just act out. And I know that acting out won't hurt. I mean, it won't help me. It would only hurt me and give these people more ammunition to uh, send me to life with a kill. So um, I just keep my best behavior because I know that's the best thing I got going for me. So do you have remorse for the victims? I think remorse is the wrong word because, you know, that has something to do with, like, a regretting the wrong that's been committed. Um, I think 
think about the victims and their families uh, every day. I can't even imagine what it would be like to go through what they're going through. Um, it's, it's painful. It's suffering. And um, I hate that I'm even associated, that my name is in the same sentence for something that's so horrific. So for one of your um, cases, you were given 108 years for something that is a felony for which you'd normally only get like a two to six year sentence for that. How do you feel about the sentence that you got and how are they justifying giving you such a long sentence when there is no precedent for that? How much faith did you have in your lawyers when you were going through the trial? Did you feel that they would be able to to get you a, a sentence that was proportionate to the, the crime that you were being accused of? Uh, I was so naive. I mean, what do I know about the court system? You know, this is my first time being in trouble. Um, I thought that if you tell the truth, if you... Uh, you know, you go through trial, the jury will see it, and you will get down that guilty. You know what I mean? Especially if you didn't do it. You know, I was just so naive of how all this shit worked. And um, I was wrong, you know. So what did your lawyer say to you after you were sentenced to such a lengthy sentence? What did What did they say? Like after I got my sentence? Yeah. that my lawyers only cared about death, not getting me to death. Mm-hmm. It seemed like, my understanding now and hindsight of how this system to work is when you're facing a death penalty, your lawyers are trying to get you uh, a death penalty qualified jury, which, which means death penalty qualified juries are more likely to convict you. They just want to make sure that they won't sentence you to death. So it seems through this whole process, we wasn't even talking about guilt or innocence. It was always focused on whether you're not going to get the death penalty. But in hindsight, again, you know, my lawyers um, and uh, shit, I probably could have been done a better job than what they did. And I was completely ignorant to law. So I've heard a lawyer say before, not your lawyer, but a different lawyer speak about death penalty cases and saying that, you know, for their client not to get the death penalty is a win and they see that as a win. Um, how would you respond to that? Do you think that they should see that as a win or do you think that they should be fighting to get adequate sentences and not manifestly excessive sentences? Did you say a win? Yeah, they, they think it's a win for you not to get the death penalty and to get, say, life or you know, the, the 108 years that you sort of, you, you got, um, as opposed to, you know, a loss because you didn't get the two to six. Do you think they should be able to celebrate that as a win on your behalf? I'm not sure what the question is. Um, you said a lot. Can, can you uh, give it to me again? Yeah, we can move on. That's okay. Let's move on. Um I, I, would, I did want to ask you what your thoughts were on the death penalty. Like before you were convicted or, or this crime actually happened and you went through the, the court process, did you agree with the death penalty? It's something that I never thought about. It never crossed my mind. Um, how I feel now, uh, I don't believe the death penalty should ever be an option. Um, it should never be even considered. Uh, for one, to say that no life has any value, to just throw away life, um, it makes no sense. It makes no sense to, for a government to say it's wrong to kill, but you 
turn around and kill for a Rome. It makes no sense. Um, but then the fact that here I was an innocent man sitting on jump rope. If I would have died, I would have been an innocent man sitting on jump rope. Since the 70s, there's been over 150 underrated people being released from jump rope. And a lot of those cases were DNA cases. So imagine circumstantial cases like mine, which is an extremely big circumstantial case. Um, how many people have died sitting on jump rope? Yeah, your case seems to be very unique, and I believe some of the witnesses and people that testified in your case, they were enticed to do so, and I think someone got a car for, for testifying. So what is your belief yeah. of the, the justice system? Do you think there's justice? It's just us. Um, it's just us. So what I found interesting about your case, obviously you got a, a huge sentence. It's so long. But the James Holmes, who killed 12 people and injured I think another 60 in the um, theatre massacre, just got life in prison. So when that happened, how did that make you feel, knowing that you were on death row for something that you didn't feel that you should be and a con- somebody that's actually gone and massacred people is not getting the same sort of sentence. It shows you the, the, the disparity, the difference in, um, I believe, how white individuals are treated and black individuals are treated. Here I am, a person who never was accused of holding the gun and killing somebody. I've never killed I can be sitting on death row. Well, they view me as, as, as there's nothing valuable about my life. Like, I just need to be discarded and, and thrown away. Society needs to get rid of me. Here you go, a guy who killed 12 people and shot. Come on. He had 60 seconds remaining. But he can get um, life in prison and they could focus on his mental health. Uh, but somebody like me, um, just get rid of. And I think you see that across America a lot, where uh, non-black people, he gets the good sentences, wow. I mean, I'm in here with white people who turn some horrible shit, and they go home and they yell at them, you know? You have 30 seconds remaining. Uh, I'm going to hear that. Yep, okay. Thanks, Rob. All right. Okay. This call may be monitored or recorded. Global Tell Link prepaid call from the inmate at Colorado Correctional Facility. For customer assistance, billing inquiries, or to thank you for using Global Tell Link. Hi, Rob. Thanks for calling back. So can you tell me a little bit about prison life? Um, prison life sucks. Like what you see in the movie, food is horrible. Uh, it's more like stale ass. You see uh, the same colors all day, every day. You got a bunch of Joe's with attitudes who come to work and, and want to make your life worse than what it is. Not all of them, that one, but you got those few that just hate and they come to work and try to make you feel it. We got racist police. Um, got a few around here. Um, yeah, it's just it's, it's 
So your sentence was recently commuted to life, your death sentence. So prior to that, though, how afraid of dying were you? Like, were you afraid of the death sentence that you faced? No. Um, like I said, uh, I looked at it as uh, the death is an easy way out. But all these people that have pushed death, um, people, yeah. It's an easy way out. Life in prison is so much worse. Um, but that was my thinking then. And, and even still now, it's like, if I was still on death row, and let's say everything went the way the shade wanted to go, and I'd be dead in five years, that means I still got to live for 50 years. Uh, so I don't do drugs. I don't participate in the three G. Gambling, gay, uh, gay sex, and uh, gambling, gay, and what's the other cheat? I can't remember. I don't participate in none of that stuff, so uh, I'm going to live a good, healthy life probably for at least another 50 years. And I'm around loud, obnoxious people, selfish people, delusional people. Uh, that's torture within itself. So, I don't know you can figure out which one is worse. So, when it was commuted, during that process, were you consulted about that sentence being commuted? And then once it was commuted, how did you feel? Um, I kind of knew, well, once we got the new governor, uh, August, and once I feel, once I found out that he had a male partner, I believe that he would understand what discrimination is like, what unfairness is like. Uh, I believe he was going to be able to recognize those things because of how um, gay men, gay women are treated in America. You know, they go through the same struggles as black people go through. So I believe that he be able to recognize the unfairness of what's going on in Colorado's uh, justice system and death penalty. So I, I believe I knew that. But then um, uh, when it happened, it kind of just happened. I wasn't expecting it. I just believed that he would eventually do it someday. And I believe he's on the right side of history, and I appreciate him a lot. And, um, yeah. Were you able to speak to him one on one about your experiences? No. No. Uh, I've had no contact with him. No okay, so you've done some pretty good things since you know you've been in prison and I believe you've written some books and you've got your GED and now you're in college. So can you tell us about that and why you decided to do these positive things, like you work in prison, you, you want to mentor other prisoners. Why do you want to do that? Um, continuing with uh, this was me on the streets. Um, I always strive for more and to better myself in any way I could. Um, I didn't want to be just a, a, a guy sitting on death row. Um, I wanted to I wanted to do things to help me transcend beyond these walls in a positive way instead of the way the media voice it upon me. I'm I'm not that guy. Uh, reaching kids, uh, helping people. Uh, I I got a keen interest in it and I enjoy it. It is what sets my total you know. You know, I uh, it's it's the sweet it's the candy for my brain. It's the candy for my soul. And as far as College. Uh, I just started in February. Well, I was kicked out for a minute um, because they don't give bail grants to people who are facing life without parole. Uh, but they started to go find me to help pay for my tuition. So that's the only reason I'm in college now. And the books I wrote, which I on Amazon. Uh, I just like writing books and it gives me pleasure to know that somebody is out there reading my words. So, yeah, I like it. 
So do you think it's important for the prisons to give people such as yourself who are finding themselves behind bars for the rest of their life the opportunity to do these positive things? It's extremely important because I'm not uh, focused on dying. I was focused on dying when I had nothing to live for. I was focused on dying I felt comfort having that floating above my head. You know, like it just play out when I didn't have a purpose. But and, and being on death row, I spent so many years in that isolation, um, where I'm just it's just me, and I'm cut off at the legs and the knees and, and the arms. I got nothing to do. It's what you want me to do with my time. Besides, like sitting there, they treated me like I was dead with my eyes wide open. I've had to say that. Allow me to take a class. Allow me to take a program. Allow me to uh, apply my brain to something. I got to college uh, seven years ago, and the day I needed to take my, uh, the day I needed a proctor to take my exam, they told me because I'm on death row, I don't have the privilege to be able to take such class. And I'm just like, what would you rather me have? Uh, be too focused on. Um. So what I'm saying is, when people got a purpose. We in prison for you create a life. We go to work every day. Um, we we got to get up at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, just like people on the streets. Give us something to uh, live for, and you will see a lot of positive change around here. Give us something to lose. You will see violence go down. If people got something to lose, you will see uh, the environment safe environment, you know. So the fact that they don't do that and the fact that they keep me out of college because I got life in a row is counterproductive. And you know, a lot of people still go home. And yeah, it's just it's not fair, I don't believe. So what would you say to somebody that says, well the victims don't get a second chance, so prisoners shouldn't get one either? Well, just take them out and shoot them in the head. Just get it over with. You know what I mean? And for all those years, they treated me like I was dead. Like I'm still alive. So, so because the victim's family uh, are not able to, to do these things. And I, I, I get it. It's, 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 it's messed up that the victim. Um, but, I mean, not but, I don't want to negate that they can't do those things, but, um, the person is still alive, so, do you just treat a person as if they did? I don't know, you know, I, I don't think that's the way to go. I don't think that's the right answer, the right solution. So, Speaking about, you know, being in prison and, and being able to get the opportunities to be able to, to learn and to go to college, do you think you would have had those opportunities had you not gone to prison? Um, college, you know, I was just trying to graduate. I, you know, in my, in my household and, and just even in the ghettos of Chicago, I grew up in, you know, like, it is. A uh, feat worthy of record if we graduate eighth grade. You know, like that's like, wow, like you graduated eighth grade. Now the thing is to try to survive and be able to graduate college because a lot of us die um, between eighth grade, between the age of 13 and 17. So if you make it to, to graduate high school, that's another thing. College, that's never even been uh, a topic of discussion in my household. I just want to diploma. And I was in school uh, all the way up until um, the first crime happened. I was I was in school. School was important to me. So tell me about growing up in Chicago and gang culture and gang violence, and I suppose just the gun culture in America. Like, what is that like to be a young African American growing up in? 
that circumstance? Um, when you grow up in it like I did, you believe that that's how the whole world is. There's so many people that have never left their zip code because leaving your zip code or crossing the street, it could, um, it could lead to you dying because the gangs um, and uh, the guns are so prevalent. I believe everybody dies. I mean, people get shot and killed every day. Um, until I came to Colorado and saw that it wasn't like that everywhere. Um, yeah. Did you think you became uh, accustomed to crime and violence from a young age because that's all you saw? Yes. Um, about the age of 10, I've seen about at least eight, nine people be shot and killed. Uh, you become used to it, you know, uh, like in my neighborhood, uh, the gangsters that come knock on the door, let our mothers know we have war, keep the kids in the house, you know, and when the shooting go down, somebody die, the ambulance pick them up and they can go back outside the place, you know. And when they start shooting again, we just gotta we just gotta run and duck duck again. It's the same shit every day. So when you found out that everywhere wasn't like that, did you feel that you had got the wrong end of the the stick, I suppose, did you feel wronged and angry that your life was like that when not everybody's was? I didn't feel, it's like more now I think about that. Um, I feel like I'm a victim of the ghetto. Uh, A lot of us don't act to be brought up in these places, uh, to be raised in these places. Uh, We didn't act to be red line and forced to be in the ghetto. Um, this was all by design. I feel that if I grew up in, let's say, Colorado, or if I, if I grew up um, where there was opportunity to jump, to where I didn't know, uh, I didn't know the neighborhood gangsters in a in a neighborhood jumps. Um, I believe, um, yeah, that I don't believe in that, and. So what what is your take on the gun laws in America? Do you feel that that that, that people should have access to guns? I hate guns. I hate them so much. They're too instantaneous. I've seen too many people die. I've seen too many people, too many kids die in drive-bys. Um, I hate that everybody got one, so you feel you got to carry one. Um. Uh, the gun laws over here is ridiculous. You know, this bullshit they say if the only person to stop a bad guy with a gun and a good person with a gun in America should be the safest place in the world. We got hundreds of millions of guns out here. I look at places like Australia and England. Now, um, you can't argue with success. You know, y'all crime rate is nowhere near as is, is, is bad as America's. Um, so I hate guns. And, and yeah, I hate them. I, I, I hate guns. Yeah, I think as an Australian, you know, I have not grown up around guns and, and we find it quite, I suppose, confronting that in America it's so easily accessible to have those weapons and they can be used in a split second to end somebody's life. So what would you sort of say to young men growing up in that environment about what they could potentially do to avoid it and to get out? Because I know what it's like to grow up in those environments. Like, for instance, just going to school. Chicago is shutting down so many schools. If your school ain't in your neighborhood, like me, I lived in a place called Motown, where that's the black zones. I had to catch the bus, the train, and another bus over to the GDA territory to get to school. Just crossing the street in the morning, from me going from the black zone side to the GDA side, you get me shot. 
like 11 and 12 years old. It don't matter what age you are. So that right there alone would prevent people from getting an education because they shut down so many schools. Um, so and then if there's no opportunity, if the best job you got is like McDonald's or working at Domino's or something like that, and it's 100 people trying to get that one job, uh, there's no jobs for you. So that is cool. There's no jobs for you. The easiest thing to follow is what you see. Your heroes in your neighborhood, you know, your heroes are the guys who you know, give you money for food, uh, for groceries and stuff like that. Those are the people you look up to. So it's so easy to fall into that those same patterns. So it's I can sit up and say, um, but uh, uh, I can't because I know the circumstances. People end up looking for the right ways to do the wrong things because they don't have no options. Like I say, don't nobody want to get out and sell drugs or, or do none of this shit. It's just, what other options do you got? So, the best thing is to pick up the move, but you got to have capital to be able to do that. Where you going to go? You move to Colorado, like I did, and then you get evicted within like the next two months, and all your shit is out uh, on the front lawn. Where you go, now you move into the side of town where you could, uh, where rent is cheap, and that's the worst side of town where the crack and the gang is at. And if this kid who only know uh, the best way to sell money is this, you can make money and sell drugs because that's all he's seen his whole life, he fall into that. You know what I mean? They can set him on a, a path to where he's sitting on death row. So, in your experience, are people hustling? just to get by and to make ends meet? Or are people trying to be greedy and, and have more than what I suppose they need? The majority of people are uh, hustling to get by. It's to ensure that rent is paid. It's to ensure that uh, you ain't got to have a big block of government cheese in your refrigerator with mayo and ketchup. So that cereal ain't for dinner. The majority of people hustle for that. Um, yeah, nobody, the majority of people don't choose to live this way. A lot of people want to do better, but how can you do better when you can't? You have 60 seconds remaining. All right, we've only got a, we've only got one more minute. So my last question to you, Rob, would be: What would you do differently if only you knew? One thing that changes everything is uh, never getting into a relationship with my my ex. Because we have thirty seconds remaining. That set my path on. Uh, that set my life on a, a whole different path. Um, but that, that's a complicated answer because right now where I'm at, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the best answer. That still will have everything. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me, Rob. I really appreciate it. Attorney call. This call may be monitored or recorded. Hi, Rob. I wasn't sure if you were going to be able to, to call back. So thank you for that. Was there anything else that you wanted to say with respect to that last question of what you would do differently if only you knew? Yeah, no. What I'm saying is um, you Never go down the path of that relationship because it it set a lot of things in motion. It, it, it took my life on a different path than where I was headed. But 
but then also where my life is now, this is this is one of the if I went down that path and I didn't meet her, then it takes away everything that I have in my life right now. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, it's a hard point. But the safest way is to don't ever go down that path that way. We still got three people here serving with us. And uh, that's the most important thing. Because that's, that's the most important thing. So what do you hope to achieve with your life now? I don't know, I'm just making it. I just want to, uh, like, if I, if I could get this associates, but first, if I could get the money to pay for the associates, and I get this associates, I should pull a bachelor's in it and see how far I can go with it. You know, um, I will write more books, and now that I'm not in isolation and I'm able to uh, talk with people and have conversations with people, my brain is being open. Uh, exposed to so much, so many things, you know, like socially, I've been mean, emotionally and mentally stunned because I've been just by myself for so long. So I'm able to have conversations, I'm able to debate, I'm able to experience new, new things and, and, and learn new things. So I don't know. I don't know if I will ever get out of prison. It's not something I got my hopes up for. I mean, not something that I got my hopes up over. But I just want to live my life and become as successful as I can uh, with my life. You know, not let these walls stop me from becoming who I'm going to become. I think it's really admirable to want to continue to push forward and to to be better. And I've I've had a look at the books that you've read. I'm um, sorry that you've written so far, and. Um, you know, I think it's amazing. I didn't know that you could do that um, behind bars. So that's that's wonderful to be able to see. But I also wanted to ask your perspective. So the jury foreman from one of your trials has written a book on your trial. What do you think about that? I think it's a good, it shows his intention, his intent. You know, that guy... When I was sitting in court and we were going through jury selection, um, and my he was answering his questions, I knew that this guy had some super motive. You know, the lawyers go off some white more truck or whatever, like how they judge a, a lawyer, I mean, a judge a juror on uh, qualifications. And I just, I'm telling them, like, the guy's not right. I go off the internet. I go off of things she's saying and things she's not saying. That's how I was able to survive in those jungles I grew up in. You know, it's just like this, this instinct that you pick up on. And I knew this guy was right then. As soon as the trial started, he showed me that. Like, he would do things where when it was a, a witness for the DA talking, he write down all these notes. But then when there was somebody up there for me who was saying things in my favor that proved my innocence, he would, like, act like he was weak. You know, like, lean his head back and like like he's snoring and then he'll look at me, make sure I see him. This guy, his first manuscript of the book, uh, Jody, the book that's out now is the polished version, but in his first manuscript, he talks about, uh, he was, he's a racist guy. He talks about how he crossed the street when he sees black people, how black people are nothing but novelties to him, how we got white, uh, bright white mouths and white eyes because I'm seeing so dark. He, he talked about how God came to him uh, before the trial, before he even knew he was going to be on the trial, and told him that he was going to have to make a, a tough decision. Yeah, so he came in with the idea that he was going to have to sentence me to death. He monetized the sentencing of my death, and that's a good insight into the guy he is and what his intentions was. Do you think that there should be a uh, a rule that a jury is not allowed to profiteer and to make money from their experience as public servants. I don't know if 
of that. I think it should be a rule that you shouldn't have an all white jury. Mm-hmm. You know, they shouldn't tell me that there's a jury of my peers. Like, this is not a jury of my peers. I believe you should never have an all white jury. As far as them writing books and making money off of it, you know, whatever. I think another rule should be is, is the newspaper shouldn't be able to print stories about the cases of the open because you got a uh, guy in prison or in jail uh, that would read articles and put together these stories, go to the DA and say, hey, this guy confessed to me. Um, give me a deal on my case, you know? And I believe that shouldn't happen. Because I think a lot of people get crossed out, but I'm a person that get crossed out that way. So were your lawyer able to have any say in the jury pool? Like, did they get to argue against the all-white jury? Yeah. Um, you've got, we get so many picks as to who we pick and who we can uh, um, exclude. But when you pick it from a jury pool, like let's say Vince is my first trial, he's an all-white jury. They go off voter registration. This is before Obama era. So the voter registration, it wasn't that many black people listed in the voter registration. So if they subpoena, I mean, uh, call in 3,000 people for the jury, you know, you're going to get the majority of those people will be white Americans. So, but then you got like in my case, the DA excluded the only black person who's qualified to sit on the jury because he said he didn't like the way he reacted to a joke he told, the DA told, that the guy didn't laugh. So that was his reason to exclude him. Wow. But if I would have got him, I would have had one white juror, I mean one black juror and 11 white jurors. I believe it do matter. Do you think- I actually want to write a book. I want to write a book the other side of the perspective. Like when I'm sitting in court, I used to tell my lawyers, like, what do you notice when you look around, right? I got like a white judge, I got a white uh, police guard in the courtroom, I got 20 uh, uh, white jurors, I got uh, white lawyers, white investigators, paralegals, white DAs, paralegals, investigators, white court reporters, white bailiffs, white person um, taking down the notes for the news for the night. And then it's just me, this black thing in the court. Like my mama was there, I would be the only black person in the courtroom. So my next idea, like, you might probably steal it, but whatever, is to have a, a white man who was charged of a crime and a black community. Where it's a crime like embezzlement, uh, some, I don't know, something that black people don't really deal with, and make him have an all black jury, all black judge, all those black things, and let's see how a white person would feel. And then they tell him this is the jury of your peers, you know, to shut up and be judged by these people. So I can definitely see how that would have been, you know, extremely challenging for you to be, you know, the, the black guy that's being judged by all the white people. But how do they fix the problem of the of the jury pool if the black community is not voting? How do you get the black community to vote and to take part in the judicial system? Well, it's not the same no more. You know, this was back in 2006, 2007. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, black votes and black voters have uh, really stepped up and, and they are supposed to be reckoned. So you can see the politics now today, the Biden, that's that's black folk that made stuff like that happen. So now jury pool is a lot better going off of the voter registration rule. But before Obama, a lot of black people wasn't uh, wasn't too inspired and were enthused to vote. So how different do you think the outcome of your case would have been had that black gentleman been able to sit on that jury? I don't know. Uh, just guessing. Uh, but I can't say. Do you think about uh, it often? I, can't say. I used to. I'm like now 15 years in. I'm like, uh, I really don't. I should have, could have, would have, and all that stuff. It drives me nuts. It drives me up the wall. So mm-hmm. I'm more focused on the future time. I don't even really pay attention to the, the X, 
why uh, none of that. It's like it's a huge relief to walk away from that stuff and, and move forward, not looking in my rearview. I did want to ask you um, how you're perceived within the prison population, given that you came from death row. Do you think that you're treated differently by the guards and the prisoners? Uh, yes. Um, uh, as far as guards go, I feel like in this prison, it's a stigma. And I feel like a lot of the people have preconceived notions of us only because of other guards uh, would, the bad ones, I was talking about earlier, the great ones, they would, um, the sports ain't good. I believe I am treated differently. Uh, I believe I'm treated on being nice, and I have to be like extra, extra good. Um, as far as the inmates go, a lot of inmates can be uh, uh, intimidated to be around. Um, us, a lot of movies, and a lot of like just normal guys that just accept us uh, the individuals we are. And how difficult is it to stay out of, I suppose, violent or difficult situations while you're behind bars? Do you find that there's things every day that happen and you have to watch yourself, or, or how, what's your experience no. like with that? I'm not a troublemaker. Mm-hmm. I don't like violence. I avoid trauma. So it's, it's, it's all about who you decide to associate yourself with. I do not associate myself with anybody with controversy. Meaning, if you're a gangbanger and you got a lot of beef on you, where you always in some bullshit, I'm not going to associate myself with you. If you uh sex offender and you rape some kid and kill them or something like that. I'm not going to associate with you. Not that I'm judging anybody. It's just that controversy brings drama in your life. So I just avoid it. You know, I, I pick maybe one or two people that I talk with and I leave it at that. Keep my circle small. So is there anything else that you wanted to add to this before um, we wrap it up, Rob? Because this is going to be going out, you know, as a podcast around the world. So is there any message that you would like to get out to people out in the community? That's nothing I thought about. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is I got people waiting in line to get on this phone. And I got to let them get on. They've been real gracious to uh, I me. Mean, they've been real nice to let me. Yeah, look, thank you very much. You've given us so much more than what I expected. So I really appreciate it. And um, I wish you all the best in everything that you do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. For more information about our guests or our show, visit ifonlyyouknewpodcast.com.au. 